David Sharp's Everest ascent caused a worldwide firestorm concerning climbers' ethics and responsibilities. His narrative is a stark reminder of the risks and rewards of following our biggest dreams and the price we are willing to pay for the thrill of the climb. David Sharp was born and raised in the charming town of Harpenden, England, located near London. As a child, he was always enamored with the outdoors and its sense of adventure. He loved exploring the nearby hills and valleys and often daydreamed of the mountains that lay beyond. He spent hours poring over maps and reading books about mountaineering, hoping for one day when he would climb the world's highest peaks. He attended Prior Purcell of College and the University of Nottingham to pursue a degree in mechanical engineering in 1993. During college, he joined the prestigious Mountaineering Club. In pursuit of new adventures, he took a six-month sabbatical from his job, embarking on a backpacking trip across the vast continents of South America and Asia. He traveled to remote regions to experience new things and take on new challenges. His travels gave him a newfound appreciation for the beauty of nature. As he grew older, he climbed more seriously, honing his skills and gaining more experience. In 2001, he planned an ambitious trip to climb Gasher Brum 2, a massive peak, 8,035 meters, 26,362 feet high. The mountain lies on the border between Gilgit Baltistan province in Pakistan-administered Kashmir and Xinjiang in China. David, along with a team led by the fearless Henry Todd, braved harsh conditions and overcame various obstacles to reach the mountain base. However, despite their best efforts, the expedition was ultimately pushed back by adverse weather conditions and the team had to abandon their dream of summoning Gasher Brum too. Although they did not achieve their goal, the expedition left a lasting impression on him, strengthening David's resolve and propelling him towards even more daring adventures. His unwavering spirit and love for mountaineering would take him to even greater heights. In 2002, he joined an expedition to climb Cho Oyu, 8,201 meters, 26,906 feet, peak situated in the formidable Himalayas. The expedition was led by Richard Dugan and Jamie McGinnis of the Himalayan Project, who were renowned for their fearless spirit and tenacity. Despite the numerous challenges they faced along the way, including extreme weather conditions and treacherous terrain, the team successfully reached the summit of Choi Oyu. However, their triumph was bittersweet, as one of their members tragically fell into a crevasse and perished during their expedition. The tragedy opened up a slot on the group's trip to Mount Everest the following year, and Dugan, impressed with David's strength and skills as a climber, offered him a spot on the team. But Richard pointed out that his tall, thin body with little body fat could actually be a problem when mountaineering in the cold weather, where body fat is essential for survival. Despite these challenges, David's unyielding spirit once again and determination would lead him into this daring exploit, cementing his legacy as a fearless mountaineer who pushed the boundaries of what was possible. His next goal was to summit Mount Everest. His first attempt to conquer Everest was in 2003, as part of the group that was led by the British climber Richard Dugan. Terence Bannon, Martin Duggan, Stephen Sinnott, and Jamie McGuinness were among the other climbers in the group. While Bannon and McGuinness reached the summit, the rest of the group actually had to turn back due to various challenges and obstacles on the mountain that almost killed them. Mount Everest towers above the Himalayas. Because of its rugged terrain, stunning vistas, and excitement of reaching the highest point on Earth, the peak had long drawn climbers. Climbing Everest is one of the most dangerous and difficult climbs in the world. It is 29,000 feet, 8,850 meters. It taunts high altitude mountaineers to take on the ultimate risk. The challenge allowed participants to test their physical and mental capabilities. Everest's erratic weather makes storms and high winds a continual concern. Altitude sickness, cerebral edema, and hypoxia can result from thin air. In addition, climbers face dangerous crevasses, rock valleys, and sheer ice walls. Mount Everest has numerous avalanches. These intense, abrupt catastrophes might bury climbers under snow and ice mountains, injuring them or killing them. 
climbers are constantly reminded of the fragileness of human life and nature's unwavering power. Throughout the expedition, Richard Dugan noted that David had acclimatized exceptionally well and had emerged as the team's strongest member. David's pleasant demeanor and talent for rock climbing also endeared him to his fellow mountain climbers, who admired his seamlessly endless amount of energy. However, the climb was not without its perils, and David suffered from frostbite on the ascent. Despite the risk to his health, he remained committed to the team, even though he helped a struggling Spanish climber who was also attempting to summit. His selflessness and bravery earned him the respect and admiration of his fellow climbers, even as he struggled with the painful effects of frostbite, which caused him to lose some of his toes. After his 2003 Mount Everest expedition, he was filled with a renewed sense of purpose and determination to conquer the world's highest peak. Despite his failure to reach the summit on his first attempt, he was the one who did acclimatize the best and he was regarded as the best member on the team, so this actually gave him a ton of confidence. However, his first attempt was not without its challenges and that frostbite really scared him, but he was still undeterred. He went on to return to Mount Everest the following year as part of a Franco-Austrian expedition led by the fearless Hugh Dobrehead in 2004. The expedition would prove to be a pivotal moment in David's life. Despite his incredible strength and perseverance, David could not keep up with the rest of the team and had to stop before the first step, reaching a height of 8,500 meters, 28,000 feet. The unstoppable Hugh Dobrehead, who was in charge of the expedition, became the 56th French person to reach the top of Everest on this trip. He was part of a team that also included Austrians, amongst others. Despite David's valiant efforts, he could not reach the summit, and the expedition returned without him. His experience on the expedition left him with frostbite again on his fingers this time, a painful reminder of the harsh conditions he had faced on the mountain and his defeat. In 2005, David quit his tech job and decided to pursue becoming a teacher. He enrolled in a teaching training course and planned to start work in the autumn of 2006. However, David's love for the mountains had not diminished. He continued to spend as much time as he could climbing and exploring, taking up all of his time and attention. Once again, David set his sights on Mount Everest for the third time. He needed to conquer this mountain. David's past disagreement with Hugh Dobrehead over the use of supplemental oxygen and his belief in climbing alone would come to a crux in the years that followed. David's uncompromising spirit would lead him to return to Mount Everest in 2006 for a solo attempt. Two long years had passed and David's desire to conquer Mount Everest grew even stronger. Finally, he returned to the majestic peak, determined to reach the summit alone, without any help from supplemental oxygen or Sherpas. Some might say this was a fool's errand, even for the most seasoned mountaineer, but David was relentless in his ambition. His mind raced with anticipation and excitement as he lay in his tent. He knew the climb ahead would be the ultimate test of his abilities as a climber. He would need all of his strength, stamina, and experience to get past all of the obstacles Everest would throw at him. As the night wore on, David tossed and turned in his sleeping bag. He thought of the long hours of trekking through ice and snow, the steep drops and icy crevasses that awaited him and the dangers lurking around every turn. At this point, he also thought about the mountain's incredible beauty, the shimmering snowfields and the towering peaks that rose up on all sides. And as the first light of dawn began to filter into the campsite, he emerged from his tent, ready to begin the climb of his lifetime. With the help of Asian Trekking Company, David embarked on his solo climb, armed with his wits, determination, and bare bones basic services package. This package provided him with just the necessities, including transportation, food, and tents up to the Mount Everest Advanced Base Camp at an elevation of 6,340 meters, 20,800 feet. Beyond that, he was going to be on his own. David was not entirely alone, however. He was part of a group of 13 independent climbers, including Vitor Negrete, Thomas Weber, and Igor Pushkin. But this was not an expedition in the true sense of the word, as there was no leader and the climbers were not obligated to keep an eye on each other. 
before he embarked on his journey, he was actually offered a spot to join his friend Jamie McGinnis's expedition at a discounted rate. But he turned that down, preferring to do it alone as he originally planned, and to climb at his own pace. He also chose to not hire a Sherpa. David made things very hard on himself. He did not bring enough supplemental oxygen, only about two bottles worth, which is enough for eight to ten hours of climbing at high altitude if something went wrong, and he did not bring a radio to call for help if he ran into trouble. He was a lone wolf, determined to conquer Everest on his own terms, even if it cost him his life. His journey to the summit was no easy feat. He was transported by vehicle to base camp while his equipment was ferried by a trusty yak train to the advanced base camp as part of the Asian Trekking Basic Services Package. He spent five grueling days acclimatizing to the altitude, making several trips up and down the mountain to set up and stock his upper camps. Finally, on the last evening of May 13th, David set out from a high camp below the Northeast Ridge, determined to reach the summit. But first, he had to climb the treacherous exit cracks, traverse the Northeast Ridge, including the infamous Three Steps, and reach the summit before descending back to his high camp. It was a daunting task, even for the most seasoned climber. He had that limited supply of oxygen with him, but he only intended to use it in case of an emergency. The early stages of the climb were relatively straightforward, with David making good progress up the mountain. But as he ascended higher, the challenges began to mount. The air grew thinner, making breathing more difficult and causing a range of symptoms from headaches and nausea to confusion and hallucinations. The weather was also unpredictable, with sudden storms and high winds making it difficult to navigate the steep icy terrain. As he neared the summit, long lines of climbers were waiting to reach the peak, adding to the already dangerous conditions. Despite the challenges, David refused to give up. Instead, he pushed himself to the limit, drawing on his years of experience and training to navigate the hazards of the mountain. He knew that every step could be his last, and the smallest mistake could have catastrophic consequences. But the rewards of reaching the summit would be worth all of these risks. As he climbed higher, he began to feel the effects of the altitude more acutely. He was suffering from fatigue, dehydration, and other symptoms, and he knew that his body was struggling to keep up with the demands of the climb. He began to feel disoriented and confused, making it difficult to focus. It was a dire situation. At some point, he was forced to bivouac on the mountain. A bivouac is a temporary camp without tents or cover, usually used by mountaineers. In the dead of night, David made his bivouac under a rocky overhang known as Green Boots Cave, situated near the so-called First Step. He was at an altitude of about 8,500 meters, 28,000 feet, didn't have any more oxygen because his extra tank ran out and he didn't bring enough to begin with, and he had problems with his equipment and was getting sick from the lack of oxygen. To make matters worse, it was also one of the coldest nights of the season. There, David lay, unable to move or communicate. He was in critical condition, suffering from frostbite on his fingers and toes and severe dehydration. Despite his determination and love for adventure, he faced the real possibility of death on the mountain. He also really needed supplemental oxygen. It could have helped him deal with the effects of the high altitude and give him a better chance of staying alive. He was not climbing with an organized expedition, so no one kept tabs on his whereabouts. Moreover, he had not informed anyone beforehand of his summit attempt, and he did not have a radio or satellite phone to signal for help. It wasn't until George Dimarescu and other group members realized that David was missing on the evening of May 15th that alarm bells started ringing. To make matters worse, two other climbers from his group had also gone missing around the same time. But even then, they assumed he had sought refuge at one of the higher camps or bivouacked somewhere near higher up on the mountain. After all, he was a seasoned climber who had turned back before when things got extremely challenging and dangerous. But as the hours ticked by, it became clear that something was seriously wrong. David was nowhere to be found and there were no reports or sightings of him. High altitude bivouacs are risky, but they could be the only option in certain extreme situations. It was a desperate hope, but they thought that perhaps David had managed to survive the night in the unforgiving terrain. 
David's expedition was shrouded in controversy, with Mark Inglis at the center of it all. Initially, Mark was severely criticized by the media and Sir Edmund Hillary for not helping David. Mark countered that David had been passed by 30 to 40 other climbers heading for the summit, none of whom attempted a rescue. Mark believed that David was ill-prepared for the climb, lacking proper gloves and not bringing enough supplemental oxygen. He felt that David was already doomed by the time he attempted his ascent, and that there was nothing anyone could do to help him. Mark even claimed that he had radioed his expedition manager, Russell Bryce, who told him that David was beyond saving. According to Mark, Bryce said, mate, you can't do anything. He's been there for so many hours without oxygen, he's effectively dead. Bryce denied receiving any radio call about David until after the climber, Maxime Chaya, contacted him eight hours later. At that point, David was unconscious, shivering violently, and had severe frostbite, and without gloves or oxygen. Bryce kept detailed logs of radio calls with his expedition members, recorded all radio traffic, and even had the Discovery Channel filming him during his time. All evidence confirmed that Bryce was first notified of David's situation when Maya contacted him around 9am. In the documentary, Dying for Everest, Mark recalled using his radio and receiving a reply to move on and saying he could do nothing to help, but he couldn't remember whether it was Bryce who responded or someone else. He also wondered whether it was just hypoxia playing tricks on his mind. He believed that if Mark Inglis did receive a radio call about David, it must have been during the descent, as there was no way for Bryce and the other climbers to know how long David had been where he was during the ascent. The decision not to attempt a rescue of David Sharp grew criticism from none other than Sir Edmund Hillary himself. The media at the time reported that he was highly critical of climbers who had passed David on their way up to the summit, saying that leaving other climbers to die is unacceptable and that the desire to reach the top has become all important. Hillary believed that the attitude towards climbing Mount Everest has become rather horrifying in his words, it was wrong if there was a man suffering altitude problems and was huddled under a rock just to lift your hat and say good morning and pass by. He was horrified by today's climbers' callous attitude and disregard for the welfare of others in distress. To Hillary, the priority of the climbers who had passed David was to reach the top, with the welfare of another expedition member being secondary. He was particularly critical of Mark Inglis, who he called crazy. On May 14th, 2006, everything changed. David Sharp was found by a group of climbers from another expedition, sitting in a cave at an altitude of 8,500 meters, 28,000 feet. He was in critical condition, suffering from frostbite and severe dehydration, and was unable to do anything. Despite the efforts of the other climbers to revive him, the extreme cold, fatigue, lack of oxygen and darkness made a descent to Camp 4 next to impossible, sealing David's tragic fate. David Sharp died on the mountain. The news of his death sent shockwaves through the mountaineering community and the entire world. His tragic end raised important questions about the ethics and responsibility of climbers towards each other and sparked a debate about the risks and rewards of high altitude mountaineering. Some critics argue that pursuing personal achievement in mountaineering was inherently selfish and dangerous, with climbers putting their lives at risk for personal glory. But many others argue that mountaineering could be a powerful form of self-expression and exploration, and that it could provide a unique and profound connection to the natural world. I want to say thanks for watching the video, and remember to subscribe if you like the content. As always, please be extra nice to the like button, and I have many other disaster videos on my channel for you to check out. I hope to see you at the next one.